Take your take your Bibles tonight and turn to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four. You have a Bible tonight, say amen. Um, we should know better than to trust the mind of man or the teaching or the instruction of man when it comes to wanting to know things of the future. How many of you just I, I mean I'm not saying you're just totally devoted to it, but you like to hear teaching about the end times, about prophecy, about things that are going to happen. There is a common interest in that, and a lot of that has gone by the wayside in, in uh, a lot of church teaching. They just don't deal with it. They don't talk about it. Uh, it's not something that people uh, just really get excited about anymore. And that itself may be a sign of the times. I don't know. I just know that uh, several years ago, I've, I've always had an interest in prophecy. I've always had an interest in, in wanting to know things uh, that are going to happen in the last days. And I'll be honest with you, uh, in the sight of all men here tonight, that I do not claim in any way to be a, a prophetic expert. I don't think that anybody really could be. There's some guys out there that are writing a lot of books. They have a lot of TV programs. They have a lot of radio programs. And we would call them the prophetic experts. But the truth of it is, we see through a glass darkly. And that is all of us. All of the preachers, all of the teachers, all the ministers, all of the theologians, we are seeing through a glass darkly when it comes to trying to look into the future. And... Um, and I remember back several years ago when God called me sort of, I guess, officially into a ministry of studying Bible prophecy is that one of the things that I did, one of the things that I really felt God was leading me to do was to really just throw out everything that I'd ever learned. I, I would be, uh, I, if you wanted to label me with the labels that are out there, whether you are post-millennial, amillennial, or what they would call pre-millennial, which means you believe in a millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years, and I do, I literally believe that Christ is going to reign on this earth for a thousand years. I believe it because the Bible says it and there's no way around it. Uh, but categorically um, at this time you could have categorized me as what was called a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial um, eschatologist I guess. Pre-tribulational meaning that I had a firm belief that the rapture was going to occur prior to what a lot of people call the tribulation, which they say lasts seven years, and then uh, at the end of that, Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, which is premillennial. He sets it up before the millennium, and uh, or the rapture occurs before the millennium, and Christ reigns a thousand years, and then there is a another a sort of chaos event on the earth, and then it's all said and done with, and you have the final judgment, and everybody's either in the lake of fire or they're in heaven. There, I've, I'm meeting, even meeting a lot of people in my travels that uh, they say, Brother Mike, I don't believe in a rapture anymore. I've heard that, I've heard that, I've heard that. And they say, you'll not find the word rapture in the Bible, and that's true, and I'll probably deal with that in this series. Um, they say, you don't find it in the Bible, and uh, I don't believe it anymore. Um, and uh, I, I don't know where they get that. I do know that one of the, even, even one of the things when I ask God to show me from scratch, to start from scratch in my mind, what is going to happen uh, I even just threw out the rapture I threw it all out and I said now God if there's going to be a rapture you show it to me and so I was reading the Bible reading the verse Jeremiah 33 3 call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not one of the things that I knew is that, that if I went to God while God's trying to teach me if I went to God and said God I already know this let's move on God can't teach you anything. Okay? It's like if you're in a work environment and you're trying to train somebody. Bradley, in, in, in your work environment, you hire in lots of new young people. Okay? Young people who think they're smarter than anybody else that's ever worked that job before. He works at McDonald's, by the way. So these kids show up and they think they've already got it figured out how everything goes. Have you ever encountered people like that? You can't teach them anything because they already know. They already know everything, and so you can forget about that. By the way, these become one of some of the worst workers that you ever have work for you in the environment. Amen? You can't teach them anything. They're so smart. They're smarter than you, and you've been doing the job for years. And uh, so I decided not to go with God and say, God, I've already, uh, I've already got my rapture figured out, so let's move on from there. I threw it out. And I said, God, is there going to be a rapture? Is there going to be an event? 
in this world where a generation or a group of people, your people, leave this earth and go to heaven without dying? Is this going to take place? So I asked the question, and God could have just said yes, or he could have said no. Instead, God began to take me on a journey through the scriptures of understanding Bible prophecy from one source and one source only. And that source was not Jack Van Impey. It was not Tim LaHaye and Left Behind series. It was not Grant Jeffries. It was not Noah Hutchings. It was not Stan Johnson. It was not any of these guys. And I'm not, I'm not knocking them or, or one way or the other. I'm just saying what I had to learn was not going to come from them. What I had to learn was going to come from the pages of this King James Bible right here. This is the more sure word of prophecy. Do you believe that? Say amen. It is the more sure word of prophecy. And so what we're going to learn, we're going to learn from this book and from this book alone. You're there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Say amen. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, but I would not have you to be ignorant. Here it is again. We're, we're preaching out of 2 Peter chapter 3, and there Peter is saying, everybody else is ignorant, you don't be ignorant. Their world is ignorant of one thing, and that is a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And by the way, I'm going to reference that later on. But the world is ignorant of that, and they have forgotten God's time frame for prophecy. They have forgotten all about that, and they're willfully ignorant of it. But God tells us, I don't want you to be ignorant of this thing. And sadly, there are too many church members out there that are totally ignorant of what will be the greatest thing to ever happen to the church in church history. Amen? The greatest single event to ever happen is the translation of the church into heaven without death. That's what I call a miracle. Amen? But most people are ignorant about it. They say, if you ask them, do you believe in a rapture? Oh yeah, I believe in a rapture. Do you, what do you know about it? They couldn't tell you. They've probably heard it talked about from a pulpit. They may have read a couple of the left behind books. They think that they have this and that and the other. Or they don't know anything whatsoever. But the truth of it is, they're willfully ignorant of something like this. As if it doesn't have any kind of application in their life whatsoever. And I would just ask you simply this. As a Christian, as a born again Christian, struggling the way you struggle. Tr enduring the way you're enduring. Going through the hardships of life. Doesn't it give it? Do you not ever sit down uh, sometimes at the end of a long hard day where it just seemed like the devil has walked all over you and said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Have you not ever done that? Amen? Lord, you could bring this on today as far as I'm concerned. I tell you, I've been in situations since I've been pastor that I've been through that I said, you know what? The only thing, the only thing that could ever bail me out of a situation that I'm in is that the Lord just start doing His deal right here right now. I found out that I was wrong. I found out that God can do a lot more things than that. Amen? It's not over yet just because you had a bad day. But we long for, and we're in fact, we're groaning. We're groaning. If we're going to live for God, we're going to groan and yearn for the day when Christ appears in the clouds. We should look forward to it. We should pray for it. We should live like it's going to happen this evening. Amen? Wouldn't it be a shame for the Lord to come on Sunday evening and you watch an NFL football? Amen? Wouldn't it be a shame? So anyway, this event is going to happen. And Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. Now the word asleep in the Bible always refers to who? Dead people. Okay? It refers to those, or, or I won't say always, but I'm saying it's a way that the Bible refers to dead people. Remember what Jesus said about Lazarus when they were seen, sitting there with his disciples. And they were questioning him, Lord, why don't we go and heal Lazarus now? And he said, Lazarus sleepeth. And they said, well, yeah, he's resting because he's sick. And he said, no, you don't understand. Lazarus is dead. The Bible will explain its own language. He said, concerning them which are asleep, in other words, concerning those which are dead...
Don't be ignorant that ye sorrow not, even as others which have what? No hope. The Bible calls the rapture, the translation of the church, it calls it our blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't have hope in this world. I don't have hope in elections. I don't have hope in men or finances or anything else. But my hope and my blessed hope is that one of these days I'm going to lift up my head and my redemption is going to draw nigh. I am going to see Jesus in the clouds. And he said, like others who have no hope, those that are asleep in the grave, those Christians. And see, you have to understand that it, it looks like that here Paul is addressing a people who believed that Christ was coming in their day, just like we do now. And some of those church members had already died. And, Paul, and they probably said, oh no, they died before the Lord came. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant. I'm going to show you something. Actually, what Paul is going to show them, and we'll see that here in a minute, what Paul is going to show them is that because they died, they get to go first. Amen? So if you want to be first in the rapture, die. Okay? Amen? If you want to be first when the Lord appears in the clouds, if you want to be the first one there, all you got to do is die. Alright? I'm not offering that as uh, something I think you should do, alright? Because we are being taped on this thing, alright? Uh, verse, uh, they'll start accusing us of being Jim Jones and passing out Kool-Aid and all that stuff. Uh, verse 14, for if, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that Jesus died? Say amen. Do you believe that he rose again? Say amen. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. He's offering us hope. We're the ones, and I've said this over and over, we're the ones who when we look at a casket up in front of a funeral parlor or in, funeral, in front of a church, we're the ones who are supposed to see that and say, I've got hope that this is not over yet. That body is coming up out of that grave. That body is going to live again. So it says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. In other words, this is an absolute, steadfast, sure thing. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, we're not going to go before them and we're not going to keep them from going. So now here, I want you to look at this, and this is absolutely, this is, thus saith the Lord. The appearing of Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory. And if you look through Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, Revelation chapter 1, I think, you will see that Jesus gave a sign to be watched for. And that sign was, ye shall see the Son of Man coming, how? In the clouds. In the clouds. Now you might want to remember that because I, I'm pretty sure that as part of this study, we're going to examine those clouds. Okay? Because I think, and I, this is just a theory, this is not thus saith the Lord yet, but I think that the world is going to be, in fact, I do know this for sure, the world is going to be offered a false Christ. Right? The world is going to be offered a false Christ. And you know what I think? I think that when the world is offered this false Christ, there will be something about clouds that will be absent from Him. I think that Christ is trying to get us to recognize that the true Christ, the real Jesus, when He comes, 